Do you know what I really love about books? Books take us somewhere else. And right now, I can't travel much. So, you know, you escape to other worlds via books. I think that's why a lot of us like fantasy and science fiction. So we can go to another place or time. But literary fiction or you know, more grounded stuff allows you to um, go to someone else's mind, someone else's life. And the beauty of more literary fiction is that because it's grounded in maybe personal experiences or political experiences, is it really gives you a sense of the other. Regardless of where you're from, you're about to read something that might be wholly... What the fuck? Wholly related to you or wholly not related to you at all. When you read something like that, you get to grow as a person. And you might not like everything that you read, you might not agree with it, and quite often you do find that in literary fiction. You find a lot of people that you don't agree with. You find a lot of people that you uh, you don't like, and <laughs> maybe you don't root for them. And that's because people are complicated, and people aren't always very nice, and, and people are, are mean, and um, they make mistakes, and they have bad judgement uh, a lot of the time. Chopped up a lot of mushrooms. That's why I'm going to talk about Memorial by Brian Washington. Which is a book about two men who think they're in love. But maybe they're not. Maybe they just exist together. Maybe they just fuck and eat and sleep together. And uh, kind of make the best of it. Brian Washington is an author based in Houston, Texas, and his first book was a short story collection centered around the city and its people called Lot. Barack Obama liked it. Now he's come to us with his debut novel, Memorial. Memorial follows the lives of Ben, or Benson, and Mike. Benson is a local guy. He is a black guy who lives in Houston, and Mike's parents moved to the US when he was a kid from Japan. Now his mother lives in Tokyo and his father lives in Osaka and they are separated and Mike still lives in Houston and he has grown up there and now he's an adult in a relationship. He and Ben have been in a relationship for a few years and is it a good one? Is it a happy one? That's pretty much the question of the book. What, what makes a happy relationship? What makes a good life together? What makes a good life as partners? At the beginning of the book, Mike finds out that his father in Osaka is dying of pancreatic cancer. And his mother flies from Tokyo to Houston to be with her son, only for Mike to then leave her and go to Osaka to see his dying dad, leaving his mum, Mitsuko, with his partner, Benson, in their tiny apartment in Houston. Now we've got Ben and Mitsuko, strange housemates living together under one roof, not getting along, and Mike in Osaka with his estranged father trying to form a bond, rekindle their relationship a little bit before his father passes. Ah, as though he wanted to be in the video, say hi. Hey, yeah. Uh, hey, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm so cute and so loud and so annoying. But everybody loves me. Yes, they do. Everybody loves me. Yes, because I'm such a cuddly, friendly little kitty. I love this baby. Yes, I do. It's a dog, she's gone. The book is split into two halves, three acts. First act is Benson and his relationship with his new roommate, Mitsuko, who is his boyfriend's mum. And then the second act is Mike in Osaka reclaiming a relationship with his dad who is on death's door, but still working. He owns a bar and he's running the bar and just trying to live his days, uh, whatever days are left. And then the third and final act shift back to Benson, which we won't talk about. These are two young men, prime of their life, but there's this awful cloud of angst and misery and depression surrounding them because they're alive and because they're in love and because they are young and frightened and angry. And their relationship isn't, I don't want to say it's not what they hoped it would be. It's just not what, um, it's not very good. So as I already said, what I love about fiction like this is that you get a group of or a pair of or a single ordinary person and you look at what makes them good what makes them bad and you get to see all sides of them no matter how pretty or ugly those sides may be ben is an upsetting character he talks a lot about 
his relationship with Mike, his relationship up until this point, he talks a lot about being gay, being gay and black, being gay and black in Texas, being gay and black in Texas with an alcoholic father. There's a lot to, to unpack very, very slowly in his character, and it's all very, very welcoming. But it doesn't necessarily make you empathise with him that much. There's a lot of sorrow to Benson, but Benson isn't a wholly likeable character even though you are asked to empathise with him quite a lot. There's still something about him that is frustrating. And because you have these two characters, you've got two protagonists, both of which write in, in the first person, or are written in the first person. Almo it almost feels like you're, you're playing, playing favourites with them a little bit. And, and my favourite is Mike. Uh, I, I feel a lot more sympathy for Mike. I think the reason is everything about the way that Benson's story is told is told by Benson through flashbacks. Benson tells us about his personal history. He flashes back to things, he remembers things, and he tells us those things. So it's all almost secondhand knowledge. It's based on his lived experiences and his perspective and his opinion about those experiences. Whereas Mike is living them in the present. He is living his relationship with his mum, he is living his relationship with his dad when he goes to Osaka. That makes him a far more sympathetic character in the moment. We only hear about Benson from Benson, whereas Mike, we see it. It is being shown to us, so we sympathise with him in the moment. His relationship with his dad is strained. His dad is an asshole, but there must be a reason for it, right? And same thing with Ben. Ben's a bit of an asshole, and there are reasons for it, but he tells us. Whereas with Mike, he learns about his dad as it happens, and he experiences things as they happen, and so you are reacting to them more. And so your relationship with Mike, just through the way that the narrative unfolds, is a little bit more sympathetic. And you do almost feel like you should take sides. You, you feel like you are entirely invested in these people, even if you don't always like them. Both of them start to take an interest in, you know, their, their eyes start to wander romantically, sexually, while they are separated from each other. Each of them shows an interest in another person, a third party. When Mike's eyes start to wander, I think, well, of course, you're out of your depth, your dad is dying, you're in a, a country that is not your home anymore, if it ever was, and you're dealing with a lot of grief and regret and fear and, and the unknown. The unknown is all around you. Then his eyes start to wander and I think, oh, keep it in your pants. Just chill out. He's going to be home soon. He's dealing with a lot of shit. Leave him alone. Don't, don't be mean. Don't cheat. That's bad. And then Mike, you think, well, well I, I get it, mate. You're lonely. It's all right. So very different effect. And that is astonishing writing. And the fact that Brian Washington is able to create two characters who are two narrators, both in the first person, very, very different people, and you start to take sides, shows the strength of his writing and his ability to write different people, even using the same narrative techniques. And what I really like as well is that Benson's chapters are chapters. They are numbered, one, two, three, etc. Whereas when you get to act two, Mike's perspective, it is one giant paragraph that rambles and rambles and rambles. And I wonder if that rambling stream of consciousness, present day narrative, helps us ingrain ourselves a little bit more into Mike's narrative. We are riding on him. We are following his journey as it happens. Whereas Benson, it's cut into chapters, time passes, flashbacks occur, perspectives and opinions happen, and we feel a little bit more estranged. And I don't know if this was done on purpose, but the, the, the effect is still there. And I think it's a really, really good one because it does make us favor one over the other. So in Ben's act, we get a lot of time spent between him and Mitsuko, but there are constant flashes back to his youth. There are flashes to his relationship with his own family. It's very personal, it's very troubled, and it's very, very sad a lot of the time. And then you get a lot of funny moments with him at work because Ben works at a daycare. All the while, you know, he's coming home to his partner's mum who is there. She is angry. She swears at him. She cooks a lot. She judges him. She is a constantly aggressive and mean-spirited woman. And you can see why. She has a lot on her plate. Her ex-husband is dying and she's not there. And her son has suddenly left her all alone in Houston. 
and uh, she's out of her depth. It was really exciting getting to see Osaka as well. Osaka is one of my favourite cities. I was planning on moving there this year, but um, gestures wildly at 2020. This, this is a book that explores love. What love transforms into? What is left of love after love has faded? What does love change and morph into? The book makes you see love as a river with branching paths and it dries up at certain points and it flourishes at others and it speeds up and it slows down and it becomes ponds and lakes and oceans. That's what this book does. It treats love as a river that shifts and changes and it floods and rain falls on it and then it dries up again and it's always flowing and changing and it's messy and it's murky and it's dirty, it's muddy and it turns brown and it's full of fish and it goes fucking, I don't know. Anyway, it love is a river in this book and it's family love and it's parental love and it's romantic love and it's fraternal love and it's platonic love. And this book really does cover all of those things. It's a positive book in a lot of ways, but I have to admit that while I was reading it, I did constantly feel a sense of sorrow. I felt sorry for these people constantly. I worried about them intensely, and I sympathised with a lot of aspects of their love life. And I just sometimes felt like I wished that I could help them, and I knew that I couldn't. And again, this is a wonderful success of Brian Washington's writing, is that He's giving you people. <laughs> He's presenting you with people and you want to help them. And you can't because they're in a book and they're fictional. But you still wish that you could do something for them. And creating characters that you're so desperately worried about and so helpless to help is really something.